protons to more than 99% of the speed of light. But those are protons, not people, not a whole person getting onto some machine. And so you don't, we, we're just not familiar with this um, predictions that I'll discuss that are like, hmm, that doesn't sound like it's right, but, but you'll see how, it's, how it works out. So before I, I, I dig into this topic, I submerge myself into it. Uh, let me just kind of tell you briefly what it is that this entails. So uh, let me just put it in perspective, in some historical perspective. So in chapter 37, right, we discuss um, the special theory of relativity. And for some reason, uh, before I get more frustrated, let me try to find another monitor. So the special theory of relativity. Um, what about it? Of 1905, that was the year. Um, which is this is what we're going to be covering in this chapter 37 of the textbook. Um, here, you consider like a frame of reference. Let's say. Um, that's moving at constant velocity relative to another frame of reference. So maybe one frame of reference is this room, we're here, and another frame of reference would be, let's say, somebody's in a train moving at a constant velocity. So something is moving relative to something else at a constant velocity. So here we consider, you know, constant velocity of one object, thing, frame of reference relative to another one. So that means, of course, zero acceleration. Okay, so what else? 1905, 
constant velocity. Um, Albert Einstein really just needed um, high school math for this. In general, just high school and algebra, trig, and uh, so this is not high level mathematics that, that those uh, behind this. Um, what else? Um, this is the theory where one discusses time dilation. So he, you know, introduced this concept of time dilation. Also, something called length contraction. Um, also, this is where E equals MC squared uh, was arrived at. And as I think of more things, maybe I'll add a few more things. Um, so he redefines some quantities over here, like linear momentum, kinetic energy, um, stuff like that. So that's you know roughly what we are going to be talking about over here. Uh, now there's another part to the theory of relativity, uh, and that's the general, as opposed to being special in the sense that it only considers some something moving at constant velocity relative to something else, he then came up with a more general theory of relativity. And that was um, 10 years later, 1915. So, it's 10 years later. So here, he did consider acceleration. Not constant velocity, but acceleration was included. So here, acceleration, not zero. Uh, it was a new theory of gravity. Well, I, uh, Isaac Newton had written a theory of gravity Right? Uh, two objects exert a gravitational force on one another, uh, and um, you know, and the magnitude of that gravitational force is capital G, the universal gravitational constant, times m1 times m2, you know, the product of the two masses, divided by the separation distance between them, from the center of mass of one object to the center of mass of the other object. Well, by that separation distance squared, that's the force. The force is attractive. According to Newton's theory, objects. Um, that have mass can exert gravitational forces and can experience gravitational forces. But in Newton's theory of gravity, um, the only way for an object to experience a gravitational force is it needed to have mass. So Einstein went beyond that and he wrote a new theory of gravity, a more advanced theory of gravity that went beyond Newton's theory of gravity. Um, in this new theory of gravity, then, you know, things like black holes were discussed, uh, something that came up, the possibility of existence of black holes. Um, and well, you may ask, so why did it take him so long after the special theory of relativity of 1905 for him to come up with the theory of, the general theory of relativity of 1950? Why did it take, take him another 10 years to figure this out? So it turns out that he pretty much had figured out the physics behind it, but he was not, he didn't have the, the mathematics to express his physics concepts. So he was, you know, he needed the mathematics. There was some mathematics that he wasn't aware of um, that he needed to, you know, use as the language to express this new physics that he had pretty much, you know, um, discovered, but he needed the mathematics. And, um, you know, he wrote a letter to a friend, a mathematician, uh, who was a friend of his, says, and pretty much Einstein told him, you know, I'm, you know, help me out. I'm going nuts with this thing. I, I, you know, I don't know how to express my theory mathematically. And then the friend said, I think that um, based on what you're telling me and so on, you should look up the work of Riemann. Riemann was a mathematician who had lived in the 18, mid-1800s. Uh, Riemann was a student of Gauss, 
And, um, but Riemann gave a celebrated lecture in 1854, I think it was, June uh, 1854, and uh, uh, pretty much Riemann developed this mathematics without the physics principle. So Riemann was very short of discovering general theory of relativity. He had the mathematics, but he was lacking the physics, the physics principle. Einstein, lucky for him, well, he came up with the physics, but didn't know the math, but lucky for him, Riemann lived before him and developed the math for this. So then Einstein then looked up the work by Riemann at the recommendation of his friend, and he said, oh my goodness, this is it. This is precisely what I need. And so then he pretty much locked up in his room for two months, lost weight, because there was, there was some other mathematician who was on this theory and Einstein didn't want that other guy to beat him to it. And then he came out like two months later, you know, and, and uh, um, had lost weight and so on, but then he, he finished it. It was at the end of 1915. And, you know, it, it's, it's more advanced mathematics. Let's say senior level, um, college level math, uh, master's level math, let's say this was advanced. It needed some advanced mathematics. Okay. So because of that also, um, of this advanced mathematics, this is not something that we talk about in, uh, in this class. Right? Um, Although a lot of the mathematics that used to be here, there's a course that Art Moore teaches every couple of years, I think. And he discusses, it deals a lot with tensors and, and so on. And Art Moore teaches a course where you discuss some of the basics of this math. Um, but anyway. Um, so th these are some things that, that come up. So this is not what we're gonna be talking about in chapter 37. I'm talking about this stuff in here, okay? But, you know, um, interestingly enough, um, like in this theory, for example, you see, according to Newton's theory, just, just to make a comment about this, according to Newton's theory, if an object has a mass m1, like the Earth, for example, and another object has a mass, like the sun, m2, and they're separated by a distance R, then these two objects exert forces on one another. So this, let's say this is the sun here, and this is the earth. Right? So uh, the sun pulls on the earth this way, right? Attracts this with a force of gravity. And the earth pulls on the sun with a force of gravity. And Newton was able to write down an expression for the magnitude of this force, right? He said that the magnitude of that force of gravity is equal to some constant that, that he never knew the value of. It's called the universal gravitational constant. He realized that it was universal, but he never had a, a numerical value for it. But he, based on you know, the analysis of data that had been collected by Tycho Brahe and then published by Kepler and so on, who, people who lived before Newton, you know, he was able to figure this out. But he never knew the value of G. But he realized that it was a constant, that it had to be a constant. But according to Newton's theory of gravity, the only way for two objects to exert and experience gravitational forces is for both of them to have mass, okay? Einstein came up with a new theory of gravity. Einstein said that um, a new way of thinking about gravity. Uh, also, for example, in Newton's theory of gravity, like if you know the Earth is going around the Sun, right? And if you know, let's say the Earth is going this way, um, the force is also instantaneous. According to Newton, if right now the Sun were to disappear, let's just say it just disappears, right? So if it disappears, then then you don't have this force anymore. And Newton argued that this would just go in a straight line. You know, if there's no net force, the acceleration is zero, the velocity therefore is uh, constant, and if the velocity is constant, it will keep on moving at the same speed in a straight line. Right? So immediately. Um, Einstein came up with a new theory of gravity where he said that 
Uh, for example, if we have the sun over here, and you had a beam of light, and light doesn't have mass. So in Newton's theory of gravity, the sun should do nothing to the beam of light, because the light, no, zero, this is zero mass. It's like, you know, M1 over here is zero. So Newton would say, oh, the sun doesn't do anything to the light. The light is just gonna go straight through. Right? According to Newton, this light beam would just go straight, right? So Newton would say that. But Einstein, in his new theory of gravity, he said that the sun would affect the path of the light, and the light would kind of go like this. So this was Einstein. And Einstein, you know, uh, said, you know, using his theory, he said, okay, the angle should be this much. Actually, he did it in a slightly different way, but, you know, the idea is that he calculated using his new theory of gravity what that angle should be, uh, and, um, and he said, okay, we can test this the next time there's a, a solar eclipse, which was going to happen in 1919. This was 1915. So he said, okay, my theory says this is what should happen, blah, blah, blah. I'm sparing the details of that. But then, you know, 1919 came along, and then they did the experiment, and the light was deflected, and exactly by the amount that Einstein had predicted, by Einstein's theory. So it was like, ooh, you know, uh, there's something in here, right? Um, but nevertheless, uh, Einstein also predicted something that just came back to me. Uh, in, with the general theory of relativity, he predicted the uh, the existence well of black holes, and black holes have been found. But he also predicted the existence of gravitational waves. And these guys were discovered were measured for the same for the first time in 2015, precisely 100 years after Einstein predicted their existence. The time dilation thing that he wrote over here in the special theory of relativity, you know, this was confirmed experimentally. say, oh, I'll just say around 1970, 1971, it was an experiment that showed that, yeah, that's, that's, that's good. And also, if it wasn't for this time dilation that we're going to be talking about, the GPS system, which is widely used today, you know, turn right, don't, turn, you know, stay in the left lane, because the kind of, it knows, just off by a few meters, where you are, or where your unit is, right? Uh, the GPS, uh, when it was created, invented, right? At first, they used, they didn't use time dilation. Uh, Newton thought that the ticking of time occurred at the same rate for everyone, regardless of their motion. It was just the same. One second was one second to you, to me. I don't care how fast you're traveling in space. It, it was just universal. But Einstein said, no, I'm sorry, Newton is not universal. So I'll talk about that. And, uh, and so when they first you know, we're working on building the GPS system uh, with Newton's theory that of gravity, conception of gravity that and, and time, that time ticks at the same rate for everyone. Um, it turns out the GPS didn't work. And so someone said, let's try Einstein's equation for time, and then it works. So, you know, but you know, the GPS, what, the last 20 or so years or thereabouts, the point is that Einstein died in 1955, and a lot of the predictions that his theories made were confirmed experimentally after he passed away, and they don't give Nobel Prize people to people who have passed. So he was never awarded a Nobel Prize in physics for his theory of relativity, even though this is what he's most famous for. He was awarded the theory, the Nobel Prize in physics in 1921, for another effect that we'll talk about later on in, in a later chapter, it's called the photoelectric effect. So that's when he was awarded the Nobel Prize for his explanation 
Uh, the experiment existed, but people were trying to explain what was going on behind it, what was the theory behind it. Um, you know you know what we do in the lab, right? Usually, okay, we're going to conduct an experiment. And I tend to talk about the theory first, and then we kind of make some predictions, and then you go ahead, and then you perform the experiment, and, and then you make some measurements, and then you compare what you ex measure experimentally versus what's predicted from theory, and you know, calculate percent error, that sort of thing. So, you know, we talk about the theory behind it, so this was an effect for which there was experimental data, but there was no explanation for it. <laughs> Albert Einstein came up with it, and um, he actually, he published that in the same year that he published the special theory of relativity, in 1905. He published six papers in his year, um, and um, one of those, which was not the one on the relativity, won him a Nobel Prize in 1921. Um, and actually, he never got a piece of the pie, for the Nobel Prize in physics because um, he, um, how should I say this? Um, he got a divorce before he won the prize and uh, apparently, and I say apparently, because you're quoting me there, um, the wife didn't wanna give him the divorce and he wanted the divorce and so I guess they agreed you know, okay, if you know, give me the divorce. If I want the Nobel Prize, it's your money. Something like that, right? And so, uh, and the, then, you know, they um, got the divorce and then he won the prize and she got the money. So, good for her. Um, but anyway, uh, there's, so I just kind of wanted to put this in, in, in perspective.